Welcome to Wednesday's edition of Renew Plus. I'm Pastor Tony. Thank you for joining us here at midweek of week number four of our access road entitled simply grace. We're looking not at just the definition of grace, but what the grace of God actually reveals to us in the new covenant. And we're finding out some awesome things here. I want to go to the gospel of Luke chapter four today. We're going to probably be in, in this particular story or Luke's gospel for the remainder of the week for the most part, at least using this as a base. And there's some good things that I think we're going to bring out here concerning the grace of God, what it reveals and what it brings into our life. Now, you know, it frustrates, negates, and nullifies the grace of God, as we found out yesterday from Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 and 21, when we go and try to finish or complete a finished work. You know, it'd be like me if I, I went home, I live in a completed house. You know, with the house has been completed for a number of years now, we've been living in it. But all of a sudden, I decide that it's not complete. And so I start nailing two by fours and, and uh, you know, sheetrock and throwing paint all over the place in, a, in, in my house. I tell you, my wife is not going to put out with that very long, I can tell you. And then they're going to probably say, what's wrong with him? Because you don't need to be doing that. You're trying to finish a completed work. It's already done. The walls are already complete. The ceilings are complete. The paint is on the walls and everything else. Why are you trying to complete a finished work? Well, that's the way a lot of people are who are, in, who are involved in man-made self-righteous religion and the dead works of religion. They're actually trying to complete a finished work. God did a complete work in Christ, and He did a complete work in us in the new creation. And that's what the grace of God is revealing to us. But when we get off of that and we start falling for those same lies that Satan gave to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden that, you know, you can make your life better without God if you eat off of that tree over there God told you not to eat off of. Well, actually, they lived in a perfectly good environment. It was complete. It was perfect. It was finished. But guess what? They went in, they bit the apple, so to speak, of the devil's lies that they were not complete, that they could be like God if they ate off of that forbidden tree and they found out that that was not the case at all. In fact, God had already created them in His likeness and in His image. He already created them perfect and complete. See, when we, when we bite into that apple of deception of the enemy, that we have to do something in order to deserve something. We have to do something in order to earn the blessings of God, in order to become righteous, in order to become holy. And I tell you, we are, we're going down the wrong roads. We're on the treadmill mill of the dead works of religion and we are negate nullifying and frustrating the grace of God and what the grace of God wants to do in our life in the finished work of Jesus. And you see that over and over again. If we'll just by faith accept what the grace of God is offering to us, which is a finished work, a completed work in Christ, full redemption and complete forgiveness of sins, and stop trying to help God out, trying to earn our salvation and earn the blessing of God in our life, then I can tell you these things that the grace of God offers in Christ will begin to manifest in our life like they never have before. You say, is it that easy? Yeah, sometimes we just stumble over the simplicity of, of the gospel. You know, Paul was concerned about the, uh, the, the believers at, at Corinth. He said, I'm concerned that you are leaving the simplicity of Christ. You know, God deals with us in simplistic form. I'm glad because God could get technical and complicated uh, and over our head real quick. We're talking about somebody who created the heavens and the earth, who measured out the waters with a drop of water in the palm of his hand. We're talking about somebody who is very technical and way over our head, but he chose not to deal with us that way. He chose to deal with us. Salvation is simple. You just believe the simple gospel message. You believe the finished work of God in Christ. You accept it, you walk in the reality of it, and that's when the fruit of it begins to manifest in our life. And uh, I can tell you, it's not all for the sweet by and by. There's a lot of good things we can enjoy when we get to heaven, but there's a lot of the blessing of God, the favor of God, victory that's on this side of heaven that we need to be walking in right now. And all that's available for us in, in Christ through the grace of God.
All right, Luke chapter 4. Let's go over there. Jesus had uh, basically returned to his own hometown, and for the most part, this was his inaugural uh, uh, ministry message, his inaugural sermon that he delivered in his hometown of Nazareth on, on the Sabbath day. So we're going to pick it up in verse number 16. It says, So Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So I want you to see that Jesus went in, he went to church, as his custom was, on the Sabbath day. Now, again, back then, the Sabbath day was actually what we would call Saturday. Well, today, under the new covenant, every day is the Lord's day. We shouldn't just pick and choose. It's good to go to church on the Lord's day on a Sunday, whatever day, every day of the week, whatever. We're not, let's not split hairs over that kind of stuff. Again, many times we're trying to, uh, we're trying to negate the, the grace of God and the finished work of Jesus by doing things, by observing days and, and, and external stuff that really doesn't matter. No, it's already a completed work. But I want you to see here that the Sabbath is a type of rest. See, God instituted the Sabbath as a type of rest. You look back in the book of Genesis chapter uh, 1 when God was creating everything and everything and he created everything in six days. At the end of the sixth day he created man. He looked at everything and said it is very good. In other words, everything that he had created was very good, meaning it was perfect. It was complete. It was a finished work. And so God entered in with man uh, to a Sabbath day rest on the seventh day. Now, it, God did not enter into a rest because he was tired. He didn't, he didn't establish the Sabbath day because he was worn out from creating everything. No, he created the seventh day rest because everything was finished and completed. And see, I believe this is, this is significant right here, that his inaugural message and what he's about to deliver to these people right here in his own hometown, in, in this message, is on the Sabbath day, the type of rest. Why? Because everything that Jesus has done for us, he's put into our account as a finished, completed work. There's nothing else that man has to do to you know, take up the slack and finish God's work of redemption and God's work of salvation. It is a completed work. God handed it all over, over to us. So I believe that is very significant right there. He's delivering this particular message on the Sabbath day, which is a type of rest, the finished, completed work in Christ. Now, look at verse number 17. And he says, And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written. Now, you'll find this in Isaiah chapter 61. He found this place right here on purpose, and he began to read this scripture to them. Now, notice in verse number 18, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Let's just stop right there. Notice the first thing. This is according to uh, the uh, 61st chapter of Isaiah that Jesus, Jesus is picked out and chosen to read right here on this day as his inaugural text of his message. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now the word preach means simply proclaim, to proclaim the gospel to the poor. Notice the first thing that Jesus said I'm anointed to do is to preach or proclaim the gospel, the gospel. All right, now let's keep that in mind just real quickly and go over to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. We're going to see some description of this word gospel, what the gospel is. Now, I know a lot of people, they attach a lot of different things to the gospel that really isn't the gospel at all. You know, a lot of traditional religious traditions, a lot of legalism, a lot of those things, anything and everything, opinions of men, cliches, they just jump it all together and, and call it gospel. In fact, I enjoy gospel music, but there's a lot of what we call gospel music that isn't gospel at all. It's nothing but Christian blues is all it is. And let me tell you something, there are no Christian blues that you can term gospel. Those are, should not be mentioned in the same sentence, so to speak. 
But notice here in uh, Acts chapter 20, Acts the 20th chapter, Paul is speaking here, verse 24, he's, he's gotten a word, a, a prophetic word that, you know, some bad things are going to happen to him when he goes and ministers. You know, that's his persecution. You know, that's part of it. When we go and, and minister the gospel, we stand up for Jesus, live a, a godly life. You're going to suffer persecution. Now, this was extreme because Paul was on the very front line. He was the point man on the front line, so to speak. And so the enemy, the devil was after him. He was wanting to shut him down, shut him up, shut down his ministry. But this is kind of in context of what he's talking about. Verse 24, he says, but none of these things move me. This is Paul's response to that. He says, but none of these things move me nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy. Notice I'm not just trying to survive. He's going to finish his race and he's going to finish it with joy. He said that and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify. Now, now get this what he says right here. To testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Notice that he ties the gospel in with the grace of God. In fact, he says it's the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel is simply the message of Jesus. The message of Jesus is of the grace of God. The reason Jesus came, the reason Jesus went to the cross, suffered what he did for us, Jesus went through all that he did for us, was because of the grace of God working through him. And notice the message of Jesus is of the grace of God. Now also notice while we're there in Acts chapter 20, verse number 32, and it says, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace. Now, that's the same thing. The message, the gospel of grace is the word of His grace. He said, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are being sanctified. Notice that the gospel of grace, the word of God's grace, when it's heard, when it's received, when it's believed, notice what happens. It is able to build us up and to give us the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Notice it's a, it should be building us up. The message, the gospel message of grace should be building us up putting us in a position to receive and walk in the inheritance that we have with all the saints in Christ Jesus. Now that's good news right there. In fact, that is really what the gospel is. It is good news. Somebody said this news is almost too good to be true. And again, I have a series. In fact, series number one is entitled The Gospel of Christ. We went into some great detail about this, but I want you to see how the gospel message is of the grace of God. It is the word of God's grace and its effect in our life when we hear it correctly, when it's preached correctly, heard correctly, believed correctly, is it builds us up and gives us an inheritance among all those, the saints, uh, and, and our inheritance. Now also look over to uh, Romans chapter 10, Romans the 10th chapter. These are all descriptions of the, the gospel that Jesus says, I was anointed to proclaim and to preach, first of all. He says here in uh, Romans chapter 10, verse number uh, 15, he says, and how uh, shall they preach unless they are sent? Notice he's talking about preaching again. He said, how, they, uh, how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel, who proclaim the gospel of peace. Notice that grace and peace, again, like we pointed out earlier, I think last week, grace and peace are running buddies. They all go together. Well, you can't have peace without the grace of God. But grace is going to bring peace. And notice he's calling it preaching the gospel of peace. He says, who bring glad tidings of good things. So what is the gospel? What is the gospel of grace? The gospel of peace? It is glad tidings. It's good news. News is almost too good to be true of good things. See, a lot of people call preaching getting on their, their own soapbox and, and you know, it, chewing people out and, and declaring their opinions and all that kind of stuff. There's nothing wrong with opinions if they line up with the word. But listen, we're called to preach the gospel, this specific message. 
not just to preach down at everybody, not to condemn people, not to tear people down, but to preach the gospel of grace, the gospel of peace, the glad tidings of good things, which builds people up so that they can in, be in a position of receiving and walking in the light of their inheritance. One more scripture here real quick. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it says, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He said, "Is for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Notice the results of the gospel. Gospel of Christ, gospel of grace. It is going to result in the power of God. That word power is dynamis. It's explosive power. It is the power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's the power that created everything. Notice it results in the power of God unto salvation. The same power that was released in the event of the resurrection of Jesus is also found in the message of the gospel when it is believed. Good news. We're going to pick right up there. Now we've laid some foundation. It's going to get awesome the next two days. So join us tomorrow as we continue this. If you like resources and materials, go to TonyCowan.org. We'll see you tomorrow.